Well, good morning and welcome to Quad City Christian Church. My name is Colin and I get the pleasure of being the student pastor here at Quad City. And so I also want to welcome those of you in Prescott Valley and those of you joining us online. We are so excited that you are with us as well. We are continuing in our series called Variety Pack, and in this series, we have been diving into some spiritual disciplines in God's Word that we are called to. We've been looking at the value of those in our life, and this morning, we're going to be diving into the spiritual discipline of community and confession. And I don't know about you, but like, I can get on board with the idea of community, Like, that's awesome. Like, we all love being a part of community, having camaraderie with one another. Like, it's important too and needed, and we can all admit that. But the confession piece? Like, no way. Like, as soon as that is in the picture, like, I'm going to step out. Like, that's a whole different ballgame. And none of us leap for joy about the thought of confessing all of the ways that we have screwed up or all of the things that we've done wrong. And if you do leap for joy about confessing those things, then I'm gonna be at pastor's point after the service, you can come talk to me there. Um, But before we dive in, I wanna start by asking you a question. What keeps you from being disciplined? I don't know if for you it's time management, that's me. I don't know if for you it's like the lack of structure, you got mixed up priorities, or maybe you have just, you feel like there's too much on your plate. Like whatever it is, like for you, like there's a number of things that can be difficult to be disciplined in. And it's really hard to be disciplined in every area of life. I remember when I was 10 or 11 years old and me and my mom, we were in the car and it was around the same time of the year, so school was about to start. We were talking about school stuff and I don't remember exactly what we were talking about, but I remember, she, I'd imagine she was probably telling me something like, do not talk when the teacher's talking, like, or just don't talk at all, like in general, or hey, stay in your seat, like don't go wandering around when you get bored. Like I'd imagine that's what it was. But I do remember looking up at her And I said, mom, I'm going to get all A's this year. And not just A's. I'm going to get A pluses, like across the board. Like I was like, I was confident. Do you know how my mom responded? She laughed. (laughs) She just started laughing. And then she goes on to talk to me about like, hey, Colin, that's going to take a lot of work. Like, Colin, like, that's going to take a whole lot of discipline. See, here's the thing. I really wanted that. And in case you're wondering, I didn't get all A's, like, that year, like, at all, not even close. But here's the thing, though. I really meant that. Like, I really wanted that. Like, I desperately desired to achieve that. I wanted to be great, I really did. But I quickly found out that I only wanted to attain the goal if the cost wasn't too great. I love this quote, it's by a guy named Jocko Willink. He wrote a book called Discipline Equals Freedom. And this is what it says. Discipline is about facing your fears so you can conquer them. Discipline means taking the hard road, the uphill road, to do what is right for you and for others. So often the easy path calls us to be weak for that moment, to break down another time, to give in to desire and short-term gratification. We've all experienced this. Like we've all had moments when we want to choose the easier path. Like we've all had moments when we do choose the easy path because we don't wanna face the struggle of the hard path. And we can all think about a time of feeling like, man, I can't meet, a man, uh, meet the demands of life. Like there's all times when you felt like, I felt like, man, I can't measure up. Like I just can't do it. And in those times, what happens often is that we want to isolate. 
It's when things get hard, when we make mistakes, when we are, find ourselves in this, in this space that we choose to isolate instead of surround ourselves with community. And we keep our struggles to ourselves. We carry it on our own. We don't tell anybody what's really going on. And when we go to that place, when we choose those things, that place of isolation, what happens is, is that sin creeps at our door. Like the temptation to choose the easy path starts to become easier to choose. And sin wreaks a havoc in our life when we're in this place of isolation and darkness. But here's the thing, what brings us healing and freedom from those struggles isn't keeping it to ourselves and battling on our own. In fact, scripture commands the opposite. Here's what James says to do when we fall short. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So God's word said, like, if you do this, it's powerful, it's effective. And just a few verses later, it says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. See, these verses show us the need to confess our sins to one another in order to experience healing and freedom. As a follower of Jesus, community that has confession should coexist. Like they should be together. And in order to actually do these verses, and I know this is mind blowing to actually do this, but like to do this, you require more than just yourself. Like you have to have other people like you have to be in relationship. Like you got to have those people in your life that you are available, like you're, you can be transparent with. To put it simply for us this morning, community with confession can produce change. It can. My question for you this morning is, do you have this type of community in your life right now? Like, do you have people that know you, are praying alongside you, that are holding you accountable, that are encouraging you, that are pointing you to Jesus? Are you that person for other people? This is the type of community that should be present in the life of every single person that follows Jesus. Every single person. I've been so grateful to be here in Prescott. Me and my family, we moved here about two and a half years ago and we love it. It's been a wild ride coming to a new place, being in a new area, meeting new people. And we've loved getting to be a part of this community. And when I say community, what I mean specifically is this community here at Quad City. It's amazing, it's fun to be a part of, a movement of people that desire to see others changed because of Jesus, to see people's lives flipped upside down because of the gospel, like to see growth and unity and joy within the community here at Quad City. It's awesome, and so like for me, it's like who wouldn't wanna be a part of that? Like that's easy to step into and, and maybe even want to be a part of. And when we look at that, like community is easy, until we add something which scares most of us to death. Total transparency. When we make total transparency a part of the thing, a part of community, things get real uncomfortable real fast. It's more uncomfortable than when you run into somebody at Fry's and they wanna to talk to you for 15 minutes while you're just trying to get groceries. So this is your permission. So like if you see me in Fry's, just keep moving. Hey, we're good, we can, t we can, talk, we can talk later. But let's be honest this morning. Can we be honest? It's not that hard to join a group that doesn't require discussing the personal stuff. I'm talking about communities that don't require you to dig deep, to be vulnerable, to be transparent. I'm talking about communities that don't require you to admit that you yelled at your kids for 15 minutes when they went to bed because they asked for 15 things immediately when they went to bed. 
I'm talking about like the ones that like, hey, you don't have to admit that you didn't read your Bible all week because Netflix just put out a new show and you had to binge it. So like really it's Netflix's fault. Like I'm talking about communities like softball leagues or bowling leagues, or maybe you're part of a book club, or maybe you help out at a food bank or volunteer at another nonprofit. Some of you guys are big on game nights, board games, and for the other of you guys, you're sports fans. That's me. Like I love sitting down and watching a big game, unless it's the Dallas Cowboys, which I refuse to watch with Jason because he's a little bit of a button pusher, if you know him. See, these communities are easy to be a part of because you don't have to talk about anything that you don't want to. And the thing with these things too is when somebody does pry a little, that you've mastered the art of sidestepping that answer and changing the topic to something else you're comfortable with. Maybe it's for you, it's like, man, I I just actually, it feels better to talk about other people's issues. Like it's a lot easier to gossip about other people's issues than confront our own and be honest about our own. It can even make us feel better for a little bit. And even when you think about this community here at Quad City, it's even to a level easy to walk in here on a Sunday morning or be a part of a life group or serve on a ministry team or help out in some other way. Like it's somewhat easy at times to do that, but as soon as we're asked to be transparent, We start to ask questions like, what good would it do? We start to ask questions like, who would people think of me? What would people think of me? Or even another big one, what would the fallout be if I told somebody about this? Here's the thing about those types of questions. They're all rooted in fear and pride. The better and more important question that we should be asking is this. What will happen if I keep the sin in my life to myself? Like, what will happen if I don't become transparent and tell someone about this? And if there is a community in society that is intentional about having this type of transparency and confession, it should be the community that's rooted in Jesus, in the Christian church. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Paul gives us a great reminder here about the Christian faith. And he tells us, hey, there's a standard that we are called as believers to live up to. Like there is a standard that we are called to as people that say we follow Jesus. But he also tells us it's really important to do that together. Like it's really important to bear with one another in love, to make every effort to do that. But how can you bear with other people in love, if you don't know the burden they're carrying, the same vice versa. He goes on, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. See, we're one in Jesus. So why are we resistant? to being a part of a community that has full transparency. And I know this morning, there's a lot of things we could list. Like we could probably fill up the board. Like there's a lot of reasons that we could list, but I think it kind of comes down to one. And it's really simple. It's, It's hard. Like it's really, really hard. One of our core values at Quad City is that we do the hard things. Like that's one of the core values that we are bought into. And here's how we explain that. Our church values obedience and surrendered living. Each week, our hope is to bring just as much application, if not more, as we do information. 
We believe that true disciples of Jesus are obedient to his commands and that followers of Jesus should be contributors to what the local church has to offer, not just consumers. Obedience and surrender living, like that's really hard. Like it's really hard to lay it all out there with people. It's incredibly hard to allow others to see every area of your life. The things you're ashamed about. The things you're embarrassed about. The sin that you wrestle with. The struggles that you're going through. But doing what is hard is a part of following Jesus. Like there's no way around it. But doing what's hard is what we, it comes with the deal as following Jesus. It takes surrender. And we need each other to do it. I love what Hebrews says. It says this in chapter 10. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Do you know how like, you can actually spur one another on toward love and good deeds? You've got to know like, that you can steer them to or steer them away from hate and evil deeds. Like, and if you don't know what those deeds are in their life, if you don't know those things that they're struggling with in their life, how can you spur them on towards Jesus? Like, how can we actually do that? See, we believe that God's word is truth. And despite how hard complete transparency and confession is, God's word tells us it's needed to grow, and he tells us it works. He tells us it's effective to see change in our life, to see us become better disciples of Jesus, and we need one another to do that. As I mentioned earlier, I joined the team here almost two and a half years ago, and shortly after being on staff, I'm sitting in my office one day, and all of a sudden, one of our elders, Tim, he stops by. And I'm like, hey, Tim, what's going on? And Tim starts to tell me about this opportunity he has for me. He tells me, hey, I would love to take you through something. It's a form of discipleship that we offer here at Quad City. It's called CTO. Some of you guys may know it as called to obedience. And so he's telling me about this and he's talking to me about what it would require and all the different things and thoughts just start running through my head. I start thinking things like, I've already done discipleship before. Like I already checked that box. I already did it. The other one was like, I, this is the last thing I wanna add to my plate right now. Like, I would rather watch a full season of Cowboy Games with Jason than do this. Like, I can't do it. The other one was, I I don't really know this guy. Like, I'd actually, I would rather wait if I could pick who I want to go through that with, and then it would be a little more comfortable that way. This last one was the hardest. I'm pretty sure that he's going to ask me some things that I don't really want him to know. So naturally, I was really excited to say yes. And uh, I jumped in to CTO, and here's the deal. I did it, I said yes, and I jumped in, and I went through the motions for a good long while. Like, I showed up, but I wasn't being real. I was there, but I wasn't being authentic. I was present, but I wasn't engaged. And so for me, over the course of this period of time, like me believing that that is better, like for me, I actually believe that for me, that would actually be a better thing than actually trying it. And I reached a point where like, I was alone, unknown, and unchanged. That my faith had become stagnant. That I was no longer being the husband and the father that I am called to be. I was at this point of desperation. And so the next time we met, I was like, man, I don't care anymore. I'm going to give it a try. And I'm just going to see what happens. And so I just was honest with him. And I told him, I said, hey, Tim, I, I haven't been honest with you. 
Like, yeah, and I told him about the areas that I've been struggling in, the things that I've been doing on my own, the habits maybe that I had got back into. I was just honest with him. I laid it out there for him. And immediately when I shared it with him, it didn't fix it right away. It didn't make it all go away. But I felt a weight come off my shoulders because I knew now that there was a brother in Christ alongside me who knew what I was going through. And he was there to point me back to the redeeming grace and love of Jesus. He was able to point me back to the gospel that gives hope and redemption. However, like I'm still a sinner, like, and you guys are too, and so like it's not a check the box thing. Our sin nature is still there. We still sin. We still mess up. We still have the temptation to choose short-term gratification over being spiritually disciplined. And this is why we constantly gotta have community with confession in our life. We've got to be meeting regularly with people in the church that are following Jesus, calling each other out, encouraging one another, and holding each other accountable in the faith. And it's really easy, because I've been here, to feel like you fall into the trap of believing that you don't need that. Maybe you've had a good week or two. Like maybe you, you're like, hey, I only called somebody a moron twice when they pulled out in front of me on the road. Like, it, we're filling the word with, that you use. But like, I, I don't know, but like, or whatever it is, or maybe you do go through like two or three weeks where you are feeling like, no, I am being obedient and following Jesus. I don't really think I need the confession piece. First John calls this out. He says this, if we claim to be without sin, We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. See church, pride will stand in the way of surrendering our life to God every time. The notion that ignoring or believing you don't need community with confession or the notion that like it would be better if I just didn't address my sin is better than confessing it. Like if you believe that, like that's a lie straight from the enemy who wants to see you fall, who wants to take you down, who wants you to get off the path of following Jesus. Uh, The author Paul Tripp, I love this quote that he has to say. He says this, as long as sin is inside of us, we all carry with us a dangerous ability to participate in our own spiritual blindness. If you can't say this morning that there are fellow believers in your life right now that know everything about you, then there's a good chance that you're feeling really similar to how I felt. There's a good chance that you either feel alone, unknown, or unchanged, or maybe even all three. This is a dangerous place to be, but you don't have to stay there. Here at Quad City, we really do believe that one of the best ways that we can become better disciples of Jesus is in a discipleship group. I'm in a discipleship group with three other guys, and it's been a great reminder for me of this need for community with confession. And when you join a discipleship group here, like the first few weeks, for four or five weeks, what you're doing is each person's telling their story, their life story. And I'm not talking just the good parts, I'm talking all of it. Like the whole thing, the things that impacted you for good or bad. And Andy, who is the leader of our group, He went first, like he led out and went first and he told us his life story and he gave us his life story for real. Like he laid it all out there. Like he didn't hold anything back. And here's the thing about that. Andy's been a student ministry leader for the last two years now. I didn't know 99% of it. Even in checking in with him, meeting with him, and getting his story before, and some of those things, like, I didn't know it. But we now were in a place where the intention was to be transparent. 
And Andy stepping out and asking me about being in a group together opened the door for everyone else in the group. Like Andy leading out in full transparency and sharing his story gave other guys, myself included, the permission to do the same. Like it opened that door. And another one of the expectations with discipleship groups is that they meet weekly. And because we need consistent community with confession. And here's the deal, church. I know that there is a list of people who have signed up and said, hey, I want to join that kind of community. I want to be in a discipleship group. In that right now that those people are on a waiting list because we are waiting on leaders like Andy to step up and say, hey, I'll lead a group. Like, hey, I'm gonna be the person to go first. Like, I'll lead. And the leaders of these groups, they, they participate just like everybody else. Like, and one of the things within that is that happens is that each week you meet, there's a time where you have a set of accountability questions. Like, and you get asked, and the group, there's like 30 to 40 questions, and one of them gets asked each week, randomly, or the leader chooses it. I'm going to share with you just some of those really quick. Here's the first one. Where did your anger show itself this week? Who have you served that you can't pay back? What hard conversation are you avoiding? What did you watch this week that you wouldn't have if your pastor was in the room? Share your screen time metrics from your phone. Where are you struggling with temptation the most? And then there's two other questions, and these get asked every week. Here they are. What is the one question you hope doesn't get asked this week? (laughs) You thought you were out, huh? Here's the other one. Where have you been, where have you not been completely forthcoming in this conversation? See, a lot of you were starting to consider being in a discipleship group, and then you heard those questions. But in all seriousness, those questions are uncomfortable. And it would be more comfortable to not be asked tough questions like this. Like it would be. But don't you want to handle your finances better and stop letting money rule your life? Like, don't you want to quit living in that sin that you've had for the entirety of your life and no one knows about? Like, don't you want to begin the journey at repairing your marriage? Like, don't you want to manage your time better and quit feeling lazy? Aren't you sick of feeling alone in the struggles and the temptations that you carry around? Don't you want to get rid of the anger and unforgiveness that you've been carrying around for years? Like, don't you want to stop living with a me-first attitude that is constantly hurting the people around you? Getting in a discipleship group can help you see these things happen. And if if you're here this morning and you still find yourself resistant to joining a discipleship group for whatever reason, here's my challenge to you. Find a fellow brother or sister in Christ this week and be fully transparent with them about what's going on. Just give it a shot. Just try it out. And see what happens. Regardless, there's application for all of us to take away here this morning. Whether you already have community with confession or not. And here are some tangible ways that you can take a next step in this spiritual, growing in the spiritual discipline. And here it is. The first one is taking a next step towards Christ-centered community. So this could be like, hey, maybe for you, you need to become a member here at Quad City and say, hey, like I'm all in to what's going on here and I wanna become a member and a part of what's happening. Maybe for you, it's like, I want to join CTO. Like I actually think I'd like that one-on-one discipleship. Maybe for you, it's serving in a ministry. Like whatever way that is, like taking your next step towards Christ-centered community. Second one, 
is working through a confession checklist with someone. On our resource page for Variety Pack that we've been telling you guys about, we've got some resources there to actually do this. So grab somebody and say, hey, I want to go through this with you. Let's sit down and let's do this and let's pray together. Like as I pray, like a new witness, like me praying to God, confessing what's going on in my life. And then this last one, join or lead a discipleship group. Join or lead a discipleship group. As we close this morning, I want to come back to where we started in James. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. See, healing comes through confessing to others and praying with one another as you confess your sins to God. Community with confession has power. It's effective. Like God says, like God's word says, it works. Like you can take it to the bank. Like it's going to work. Just a few verses later, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Some of you here this morning, you would say like that you are in need of rescue. That you are in need of of help and you realize that the place you're in right now is a dangerous place to be the first step is to just toss your hands up and make somebody aware to surrender to that God's way and his his calling in your life to pull a brother or sister in Christ, somebody that cares about you, someone that's following Jesus and say, I can't do this alone anymore. I need help. I need somebody to know what's going on in my life. God offers us freedom and forgiveness when we confess. And the community that we are a part of is rooted in the grace of Jesus. And when you make confession a part of it, you will find healing. You will find growth and you will find change. You'll become a better disciple of Jesus. It's a spiritual discipline that we must have to become more like Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that we do have your forgiveness and grace. And God, we thank you that through your death and resurrection, that as a community of believers, we are all in the same playing field. That we are one. And God, I pray that each of us would take a next step towards community with confession. That we'd be willing to to reach out to somebody, pull somebody beside us and say, I'm struggling. God, I pray that we would consider becoming and being a part of a discipleship group. And God, I pray that each person in this room this morning would know they're loved, they're cared for by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.